So dear colleagues, dear friends, I would welcome you all to our new approach for the future of the legal education. So Bahçeşehir University uh, Institute for Global Understanding of Rule of Law and Hamden Mitchell uh, Law School Business Center are organizing a program for you all with the support and uh, help of three lawyers. Lawyers from Istanbul, Vehbi Kahveci, Naim Karakaya, and Salih Oktar have been very uh, generous to make uh, Yenisei advanced legal studies for me. So since my name is Feridun Yenisei, and they called a new initiative and they make each month a seminar on a legal subject. But additionally to that initiative, we have now looking forward to make a five week of uh, transnational lawyering skills program with you all. And this program will be conducted by uh, Professor Sonstank and uh, Phyllis Cox, who is also the uh, international uh, advisor of Eagle, and also Hassan Jambekci, uh, our administrative assistant, will be supporting us. And in this week, weeks uh, uh, actually, we want to make a program about continuous legal training for everybody. And this will be a transnational work. And our ultimate aim is if a lawyer from Istanbul, Ankara, or from another part of the world, maybe from uh, India, from Poland, from uh, Russia, maybe, <clears throat> takes part in a uh, conference or a meeting in a lawyering office in London or in US has the first knowledge about how the US system and British system is working. And we are going to start with the comparison of some legal systems today and discussing about the legal education, lawyering, and judging in uh, the whole uh, uh, systems. We have issued invitation to all of you and you have participated to this program. Thank you for that. And also the Justice Academy in Turkey, which is giving training to future judges have uh, accepted our invitation. And now we have also some colleagues from the Justice Academy candidates. We have also students and uh, also Finnish lawyers from various parts of the world. And in this part, we are going to talk about the issues. And now I'm giving the floor to John Sunstein and he can lead us through the program. Thank you for joining us today. John. Hello everyone. I'm, I'm uh, deeply honored to be a part of this. Uh, I met Farad in, in 2001, and it, uh, that experience in Turkey changed my life. I've been back, I don't know, 10 or 11 times, and uh, every time I go, I learn. And from that experience, I realized that the, the things I thought I knew about being an advocate were, well, rather shallow, because I didn't look at how lawyers in other countries were doing the same thing. And the more I travel, the more I realize that the only profession in the world that brings everyone together are, is lawyers. And uh, we are working on programs at our law school along with uh, Eagle uh, to really connect a global community of lawyers and leaders and students, not to say here's a system that works, is what can we learn from each other to be better at what we are doing? And we as lawyers all do the same thing by representing people, keeping them out of trouble, uh, helping them out when they get in trouble, 
uh, to prevent things, to have them put their plans together. And we do it within our own cultures and systems. And as we go through this next five weeks, we will be talking about first the training, how can we train better and continue to train? And then we'll talk about the criminal justice system. And then we'll finally talk about trials and jury trials and court trials and opening speeches and final arguments and cross-examination. At the end, we're gonna finish with a full jury trial. Uh, in Turkey, it'll be a court trial, but in, it'll be, we'll have English jurors and American jurors. We'll have a, an American judge, a British judge and two Turkish judges. And uh, we'll try a, the trial that you have, the state versus cartel and see how it plays out with interruptions and discussions about uh, what we're doing and what we're doing well and not doing well. Uh, this should be a conversation. So we will be, um, you can raise your hand, you can get in, you can talk uh, in a chat at any time. If we have lots of questions and we can't get to them, we will, uh, Willow and I and uh, uh, Willow Anderson and Manali Ralaraskar from Britain will do our best to answer your questions between sessions so that it should be a discussion where we can all learn from each other. And I think that's the thing that we, do, we really don't do very well is learn from each other. So that's what we're gonna try and do. Uh, as we say, fingers crossed. Uh, that may be a bad sign somewhere else, but if I'm in trouble, I cross my fingers. Uh, so you can join in this, have a discussion. So first thing we're gonna talk about, I wanna introduce uh, each other. And I think we have a short video and we're gonna interchange videos and discussions and we've tried things and we have some things on our own YouTube channel. And we're gonna see if we can use this Zoom technology to do what we could never do in real life. So please join us, get engaged. Uh, questions, critiques, disagreements will be welcome. So uh, Hassan, can you play the first video, the introduction one, it's very short. Okay. You'll know this is not real polished, so we uh, did it last Sunday. Can you see my screen right now, Professor? Yes. We are going to be having an informal discussion between Willow Anderson from Minnesota, who is a trial lawyer, and Manali Ralaraskar from London, who is a, a criminal barrister. In the US, our criminal jury trial system only began in the late 1700s and came through our Bill of Rights, which required that every defendant who could go to possibly go to jail have the right to have a lawyer and the right to have a jury. We don't have any specific training for trial lawyers in the U.S. and any lawyer admitted to the bar in the U.S. can be a trial lawyer in any criminal case. The training for trial lawyers in the U.S. is not required. But if we go to Britain, which is the model for our system, uh, we see a much more remarkable training system and I, I think that the barristers are uniquely qualified to represent clients in the jury trials or even in court trials. So I'm gonna let Manali talk to us about her system and her training. And hopefully sometime during this, she'll show us her wig and her gown. Uh, and we can see how the systems work. Now we're not gonna say that one system is better than the other uh, anywhere. They are all the system of our own countries. Our job as lawyers is to within the rules and within the systems do the best job as advocates as we can. So Manali, would you start to explain to us where your jury trial system came? I understand it's been there quite a long time. It has, hello everybody. My name's Manali as John said. So if I can just um, start off by thinking about the jury system. So we've had trial by jury since almost since time began, but certainly as early as, as 1066, that's when the, um, it was established that jury trials were, were firmly in, in play. So very, very, very much part of our, our, our legal system. Um, and even now, even with, with what's happening globally with the pandemic, um, there's no discussion or consideration that, that the jury trial system will will stop, even though there has been some talk recently in the newspapers that traditionally it's always been 12 members of the jury, but that that there has been talk that that might go down to seven. But um, 
I, I, I can't see that really happening. So, uh, so yeah, it's a very ingrained, long, long established principle in our in our legal system, and it works. It it works. So, I'm a big big advocate of the jury system. In, in our country, we have jurors of twelve people, but for lesser crimes, our Supreme Court has allowed um, us to have six person juries. And they have to be unanimous, but they have six person juries. Um, we do have a different jury selection process and we'll talk about that later on. But um, with the jury system, yeah. with the jury system, uh, we bring in people and get to question them about being jurors. What do you do when you select jurors? Manala. Well, we, we don't have we don't have that ability to, to question them. We do have a right to um, veto them or oppose oppose them, but that's not really something that is used very often at all in 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 this country. It's not it's not sort of almost like the films where you can sort of object and and the jury member will be sort of uh, removed from the jury box. So. The jury is very much selected at random. So literally, if you imagine, there's there's a box of names that is put before the court usher, and she just picks out twelve names from that box, and then the jury are those twelve members are are called to the jury jury box, and they are known as the jury in waiting, and it's at that stage that they take the oath, and once they become sworn then they are the jury for the purposes of your of your trial and it's before they're sworn that you can make that make any objections that you you want to about them but as i say it's really not a mechanism that's used very much at all um in our in our system um or, or, uh, I, i've never seen it in my in my practice and i've been in practice for over 20 years so it's 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 very, very rare to object or to, to have a jury member um, not sit on the jury. Well, we'll talk about the American system, the uh, US system in a bit, but the interesting part about our country, we have uh, our 50 states plus our federal government and we have 50 different processes. Each state is independent. So we don't have a national trial practice system or in Britain, they have a national system and that's the same in lots of other countries. So first of all, we don't get trained as well as uh, the barristers are trained. And Manali, will you tell us how you're you were trained or how people are trained to become barristers? And I believe you prepared some slides that we can talk through with your training. Yes, yeah. I mean, before I talk about that, I, I, yeah, I mean, the fact that there's sort of 50 different you know, count states to consider and, 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 and varying laws. I mean, it's, it's hard enough knowing one set of laws. So I don't know how how you guys kind of manage to do it if you're not if you're practicing in different in different states. But um, but yes, so training in you, the United Kingdom is um, it's very thorough. Um, and I think here our system is is adversarial. So what that means is basically we have um, two two types of lawyers so I, I understand that in your system generally everybody's called an attorney whereas in England we still have the division between what we call a solicitor and what we call uh, a barrister so a solicitor is is generally someone who prepares the cases um, who doesn't traditionally present although the 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 both branches have fused together or have merged together in in the last sort of 10 15 years so you do see some solicitors presenting the cases but traditionally it's the barristers who present the cases and and they're the ones that go go to court um explain to us your undergraduate or your training to uh so normally so a very a, a normal route so my route um was that i uh did a three-year undergraduate law degree um, and then you do what is probably equivalent to a master's but we call it uh, a professional qualification so depending on what route you wanted to take is depending depends on what qualification you do it but if you want to train as a barrister you do the bar professional training course so the bptc and if you wanted to train as a solicitor you would do the lpc so the legal practice course 
both of those courses are the same amount of time. They're both uh, one academic year. And then after that, um, you go on to do your practical training. So almost like an apprenticeship. two-year training contract with a law firm and whatever they wanted to specialise in. And a barrister would do a one-year pupillage, we call it. And they call it a pupillage because you have someone called a pupil master. So you are you are a pupil um, and they are your teacher, effectively. And that's for one year. So the first six months you spend observing all the cases. And then the second six months, they call it being on your feet because you are actually standing up in court on your feet presenting the cases. And once you've done that, then you are qualified to conduct your own cases, whichever two years or one year, whichever route, route you take. Yeah. Now, if but the, you... training, the training is very different for solicitors as it is for barristers. Advocacy is the key for barristers. So you are trained heavily in advocacy. So applications, uh, 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 cross-examination, opening speeches, closing speeches, um, submissions of no case to answer. The predominantly you you are trained in in that. Whereas a solicitor, you're trained much more globally in terms of how the office runs. So you will learn things such as accounting. Um, you'll learn more about the procedures, so more about criminal litigation in terms of the rules and the procedures, rather than the sort of pure advocacy. Well, suppose I take my undergraduate diploma, my degree, and then I become a barrister, takes the one-year barrister course. What, what happens if I don't get a pupillage? Does everybody get a pupillage? No, and it's um, you know it's very it's very hard actually now, and I think because because um, barristers are self-employed, so we that's the one big difference between barristers and solicitors. Solicitors are employed, so your firm employs you and they pay you a regular salary, whereas barristers are all self-employed no matter what area of law you practice. So if we don't work we don't we don't get paid so it really is quite tough and if you think about how much it costs to to get qualified so um these postgraduate qualifications are very expensive so to do the lpc which is the solicitor's course i think that roughly costs about 15 15 to 17 thousand pounds and to do the bar practice course um, I think that must now be around 18 to 20 thousand pounds and that's just for a one year course. Um, so it really is, you know, you have to think very carefully about how, you know, how what you think, you know, how committed you are and how how you want to kind of progress because not everybody, not everybody is able to get it certainly not straight away. Um, so you have to be you have to be committed really. Well, there's a rather large percentage of sorry to interrupt we only have um a couple of minutes left on this tape <laughs> so i think we need to take a, a break um there's just two minutes left so if we take a break and then we'll start um a second session good thank you okay <clears throat> Tan, you come back to us yes um what we'll talk about is the different training uh, programs for an advocacy uh, and we want to hear about from Turkey and if there are people from other countries who have experienced the training is, of advocates in their countries, you can join in. So now Hassan, can you play the second uh, video, please? Before the break, we were talking about the route to become a solicitor, a barrister, or a lawyer in the United States. Benali, why don't you pick up from there? So from beginning to end, so if you wanted to become a barrister, it would take you, if you were to do a law degree, then your post-law qualification and then your pupillage, so the one-year training, it would take you five years. And then for a solicitor, it would take you take you six years because don't forget their post-degree um, post qualification is the same length, it's a year but then their training is two years, their training contract is two years. 
So that would take them, uh, that would take them three plus one plus two uh, longer than, than it would do to, to become a barrister. So it's, it's roughly the same, but I don't think it's as long as it takes your students to qualify, is it, John? Well, what, what was your experience? Right. In the United States, in order to get into law school, you need to have a bachelor's degree in any right. subject. And that's a four year degree at a minimum. Sometimes it takes people longer than four years to get their bachelor's degree. And once you've obtained either a bachelor of arts or a bachelor of science, then you can apply to law school, which is three years. They make no distinction between barrister or solicitor. So if you go to law school, um, it's all the same. Sometimes they have different maybe specialties like intellectual property, but no, no difference between a barrister or a solicitor. Um, and then when you graduate, there's no specific requirement of like a pupillage. Some people maybe during law school or after law school may do some kind of clerkship for a judge or an attorney, but it's not a requirement. And if you wanted to become a trial lawyer or something more like a barrister, um, you can take some additional classes after law school, but it's not a requirement. And um, I think most, most attorneys probably don't. And you just um, stand up on your feet and do it the hard way. So if, if you get your law degree and then you pass the each state's bar exam, you can practice yeah. in that state. So like for me, I have a Minnesota bar passage. I really can't practice in Wisconsin unless I get admitted specially. So we practice in our own states. So once we get our bar passage, at that point, we can, we can practice law. In England, if you get your um, bar course or your solicitor course, you can't practice law unless you get your training contract or your pupillage, is that right? That's right, yeah. And so there are, there are a lot of people who either don't take the, the law degree uh, to become lawyers or those take their law degree, try to get a pupillage or a contract and don't get it and don't practice law, is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the harsh reality of it. I mean, there are a lot of people who, who unfortunately don't, don't um, you know, make it necessarily to what they thought was their, you know, first first choice, which was to, to become a, you know, a solicitor or, or a barrister. As you can imagine, competition is 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 fierce. Um, you know, so I think uh, some people, I do know some people who uh, do the qualifications, so the post degree qualifications, just because they are good qualifications as standalone qualifications anyway. Um, you know, they, they provide you with good, you know, drafting skills, presentation skills, um, teamwork skills, you know, so those are inter transferable in terms of other employment that you could, you could seek. So it's, it, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that was sort of their first choice, but it's become a plan B for some students who aren't successful. So let's go through the slides quickly. And later on, at, at the end of that, on the other side, we'll talk about the systems in other countries. So, Willow, will you start? And Manal, will you talk through them for us, please? You got it? Good. All right, go ahead, Manali. So just it, it, they're, they're titled the English legal system because I've just tried to give a sort of brief overview of what I think you might find um, the most useful and the most interesting in terms of, you know, the key elements of our English legal system. So um, I've sort of begun by asking the question, which I think most students have to ask themselves, you know, is what, what do you want to do? Do you want to become a solicitor or do you want to become a barrister? Um, and I, I've sort of chosen chosen this slide because some of some of our students may well recognize recognize him a uh, very famous advocate should we say Harvey Specter from Suits for those of you who who watch it so he is what we would call a solicitor um, in this in this country because he works for a firm um, you know they do a sort of lot of commercial corporate work so that's what we would sort of say is a solicitor uh, and then I just briefly spoke about what the role of a solicitor is and the key sort of differences between what a solicitor does and what a barrister does. So a solicitor, as you can see there, is employed. 
Um, they don't present the case, they normally prepare it. But because of the changes in our legal system, there is a, there is a slight crossover, but certainly the two, the two still very much exist. Um, whereas barristers, you know, as you can see, uh, I think I've put, sorry, I think I've put the route to, but barristers, yeah, as you can see, they're a self-employed. Um, they present the case, they draft opinions, and they make all of the appearances in, in court, whatever, whatever level of qualification um, that they are. So th those are the key differences, really. Um, and here we can see now the routes to qualification. And, and, and as I've said there, um, it's very clearly set out the steps that you have to take. So I was referring to, I think, if you didn't do a law degree, you could do this graduate diploma in law, which is the one year, one year programme. And that obviously will add on an extra year to your uh, educational process. Um, but essentially, after you've completed these steps, you are effectively a, a solicitor. Uh, and the same, the same sort of applies for a barrister, apart from the only difference is, is that you only have to do the one year, one year training. So uh, I think that if um, in terms of costs, I think the next slide probably deals with, with that in terms of routes to qualification. Um, I think we've got uh, the cost of training. So there you can see, John, that a law degree on average is uh, £20,000 a year. And when I say that, I'm just talking about the tuition fees. I'm not talking about the sort of accommodation costs and any other sort of living expenses that, you know, we all obviously have, have to think about. But those are just the tuition fees for a law degree. And that's a very basic law degree in so much as you know if you go to the sort of you would call them ivy league we call them red brick universities you know so oxford cambridge durham bristol they obviously are more expensive so this is very much a ballpark figure of you know how much it would cost um the gdl so that's if you don't have a law degree that's that's now i think approximately twelve thousand pounds and then you can see there the two post uh, post qualification courses, you can see the difference in cost, but still, I mean, a, a lot of money. So, at least £95,000 before you've even begun your training, you know, begun your training contract or your, your pupillage. So, uh, a, a huge amount of money. Um, and you really, I think, have to be, you know, very serious about what you what you want to do and, you know, what you want to achieve. So uh, because it's not, um, you know, it's not a light investment, is it? Um, In the U.S., uh, Manali and Willow, um, our undergraduate four year degree can run, uh, well, from 16 to $50,000 a year, not counting housing. Well, Law degrees start at uh, 35,000 and can go higher. Uh, so you have that uh, amount, four years of undergraduate and three years of law school. You take the bar exam, then you can practice law, uh, but it'll guarantee you have a business. In the UK, you can have that expense. And if you don't get a training contract or a pupillage, you can't practice law. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a scary of money really when you think about it and as you said before John you know the vast majority don't actually not through any fault of their own but just through circumstance you know competition is fierce um and and you know it's it's uh, yeah you, you you have to you have to be to have thick skin and be determined I think you know not give up at the first first rejection or first knockback, you know, keep keep going because uh, certainly when I, even when I was qualifying, I, I didn't get pupillage straight away. And, uh, you know, I, it took me three years and I think I gave myself five years after my BPTC to, to say, if I didn't get it within those five years, I would, I think I wanted to be a journalist, but you know, uh, that was my plan B, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't expect it to go smoothly right from the beginning, I think. How do you nope. get a pupillage? Do you is it like applying for a job or how do you how do you obtain a pupillage? Yeah, so is th there's different ways, but 
predominantly we have what we call a centralized application system, which all the chambers sign up to so that then you get a sort of template application form that you fill out and it, you know, it has the standard things such as academic qualifications and results and, you know, activities and hobbies, but then it also has, you know, questions which are more geared towards your analytical skills and your behaviour traits and, you know, your personalities. So, um, they're all standard questions. So you submit that you submit that application form and that that takes place roughly in about March for because our pupillages start at, in the, at the same time as the academic calendar. So September um, and it, within that application, I think you're allowed to apply to 16 different chambers. Um, and then, yeah, depending on how how your application is, it's it's a sort of interview interview process which can be anywhere between one to three interviews with written applications oral presentations so uh yeah gone are the gone are the cv days where you just print out uh you know cvs and sort of put them in envelopes and and, and hand them out it's it's a very tough process now really okay, we'll finish with this last slide and that's the earnings and then we're going to go to other countries to see how their training programs work I have one other question, Manali. When you are a barrister, is there continued required training during the period that you're practicing law? As a yes, there is. So, as part of your um, part of your sort of obligation, should I say, when you want want to become a barrister, you have to join a inn. So they're called inns of court. Um, so there's four of them in London. So there's Inner Temple, Middle Temple, Lincoln's Inn and Gray's Inn. Um, and once you join those, one of them, whichever whichever one you want to join, um, you also have to, to partake in sort of 12, 12 dinners to just to sort of familiarize yourself with your inn and get to know people there. It's sort of almost like a society really. Um, and that in then will provide you training every year. So you have a minimum number of hours that you have to have to do your training. And I think before you are uh, five years experience, I think the number amount of training is something like 26 hours. And after you've been doing the job for five years, it goes down to 12, 12 hours every year. But yeah, they're very hot, especially on, I think, advocacy, because you know, as you know, John, you know, you can develop bad habits very quickly. And I think um, they just like to keep an eye, especially in the early days with their new barristers, that they are doing things, you know, to a high standard and they're doing things properly. Uh, is, is the legal system the same in Scotland and Northern Ireland or Ireland? No, not the same in 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 those those parts that you've mentioned. They have a slightly the training is roughly the same, and there are lots of crossovers in terms of, for example, contract law, and also you know in terms of the core offences, even in criminal law. But the main difference, I think, in in Scotland certainly is is that the, the standard of proof that's required in criminal cases, uh, as as I'm sure you know, in England you have to a guilt a jury has to be sure beyond reasonable doubt is, is is the phrase that you'll all be familiar with but in in scottish law the case can be proven or not proven and that's a slightly lower standard so that's that's a big difference um so yeah similar concepts in law but not identical all right i think we'll take a break but um but first before we do Manala, will you show us your wig that you have because we saw yes. a picture of a barrister with her wig. Would you get yours and show us? Yes, of course. So so I, I think I've used one of the slides, the fun facts right at the end, but you can refer to that to that at the end. So when you when you qualify as a barrister, yeah, you there's one shop in well, it's not there's not just one shop, but there is a, a shop called Eden Ravenscroft. And everybody who is qualified as a barrister will get all their equipment from there. They've been supplying barristers for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. So uh, it's it's fun going there for the first time. So you get this you get this wig tin. Mine is a bit battered, as you can see, because it's been at the bottom of my bag, being bashed around for a, a number of years. Um, and you have your name printed on that on that tin so everybody knows that it's it's your own tin um, and then if we just open it up so in here 
you can see I've got my I've got my wig and these wigs I think I also put in one of the slides these wigs are um, are made from horses hair so they are and you should only own one wig in your lifetime that's the sort of rule so that's my wig which has got my name on at the bottom I'll put it on for you so <laughs> it doesn't quite go with today's thing so it sits quite comfortably on my head um, and then you have to wear these uh, these are called bands so these are like collars that you have to wear underneath your uh, underneath your shirt so you just put those on as well so I'd normally I'd have a I'd have a suit jacket on but um, if I just tuck that in Uh, and then you just pull those, pull those out so that you look, yeah. And then you just wear a, uh, a black gown on, on top. Unfortunately, I haven't got mine at the moment because someone stepped on it last week and it's got a big hole in it. So I've had to send it off to be, uh, to be fixed, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so if depending on what kind of barrister you are, so Queen's Council, so that's one of the most senior barristers you can have in, in our country, um, Queen's Council have a much shorter gown than sort of normal, normal barristers, so, uh, so that's how you can tell that they're more important because their gowns are considerably shorter than, than the normal barristers. And if you're ever led on big cases, so um, often in our in our in our legal system, um, a lot of cases which are big, so murders, big drug cases, big fraud cases, they will require the assistance of two barristers because of the volume and complexity of the work. Um, and in that case, the leading counsel, which will normally be a Queen's counsel, will have a junior counsel. So probably someone like me or someone a little bit more senior. Um, and if you do a really good job for your leader, they then often give you a sort of red, uh, uh, sorry, a blue velvet bag for you to put your wig and, wig and gown in, which you, uh, which you then have to put your, initialise your names on. So, uh, so yeah, there's lots of, lots of little traditions that are involved in, in being a barrister, which, um, you know, which are, which are fun, really, I think, you know, it is, you know, your lifelong member of, um, of a very special club. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very good. And just finally, they used to actually wear these wigs because um, to give you some sort of anonymity, I can't say that word, but to keep you mm. sort of, yeah, to make you sort of not look like you would in normal life so that your clients didn't recognize you if you were out walking walking the streets um it's almost a sort of disguise to protect you uh from being accosted in the street if uh, if your clients then recognized you and they you didn't get them the result that they wanted i think that's interesting uh my observation is that the i'm not sure about the wigs but the gown actually controls the behavior of the barristers in court there's more dignity in our country, anybody can wear anything they want. The judges probably would not allow uh, real casual clothing. Uh, yeah. Men will usually wear a sport coat or, or tie. Uh, women will dress in trial garb. Uh, but that's not always true. And depending on the state, in some places in the western part of our country, you'll see people coming in very casual with cowboy boots and very casual attire. Um, I think in other countries, in France, other countries have, in Germany, they do wear gowns. I think it would be yeah. very important in our country to have those gowns in order to control behavior because sometimes when people spend all sorts of money and uh, strategy on the way they wear their clothes, they lose track of the what we're trying to do and that's to uh, try cases. But lawyers tell me that if they anything they can do to be persuasive, if it means adjusting your clothes to be persuasive, people will do it. So I think yeah. that's an, an important thing of leveling the playing field that you do in England that we don't do. Willow, do you yeah. have any comments? Well, I think in the United States, lawyers have about the most boring wardrobe I've ever seen. And I look at my own wardrobe, it's like black or navy blue, maybe yeah. brown, tan in the summer. And we do have rules of court that say that we're required to wear a jacket, men are required to wear a tie. Um, so it's not, it's, 
um, pretty boring attire, what I see in court, but certainly I think it doesn't have the dignity that I can see over here. <laughs> well, I think we'll, we'll end at this time, take a break, and then we'll come back and talk about other matters such as the structure of the trial. Excellent. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, see you soon. We're back. Hassan, good. Yeah. Hello, everybody. We're back Hello. again. Let me just say that uh, in the American system, uh, as Willow said, the four years of undergraduate and the three years of law school, there is no requirement uh, to have any specific advocacy training. Now, most schools have them. The uh, National uh, American Bar Association has said that we should have some advocacy training, but there's not any real rule that says people coming out of law school have to be proficient in advocacy. Uh, many of the bar exams in different states have advocacy questions, but they're, they're not practice questions, they're written questions. So once I graduated law school, I had no idea how to be a trial lawyer. I had no idea how to be a lawyer. All I knew was how to take exams. And I got very lucky because I went into a prosecutor's office. And we'll talk about the differences. I went in as a prosecutor, um, my pay was about $9,000 US, but that was in the last millennium, uh, almost 50 years ago. Um, well, uh, Willow, where did you start as a, as a lawyer when you came out of law school? Are you there? There we go. Um, I should let you all know that I took uh, criminal law from Professor Sonsting over 20 years ago. Um, so I've been practicing law about 20 years and I was uh, able to get a job as an assistant attorney general in the Minnesota Attorney General's office where I tried cases in almost every Minnesota county. The most uh, difficult cases I tried for a number of years was um, prosecuting sexually dangerous people and sexual psychopathic personalities. So the worst sex offenders in our state. Um, and that job allowed me to do a lot of trial work, but then also to go to the court of appeals where I argued over a dozen cases to our court of appeals. So after doing that for about a decade, then I went into private practice uh, where I represented injured railroad workers. These are federal jury trials. So I was trying cases outside of the state of Minnesota in places like Oklahoma and New Mexico. Um, our clients were uh, railroad workers who had died on the job uh, working as railroad workers. And these were multi-million dollar um, jury trial cases. So for, for me as an attorney, as a trial lawyer, an absolute dream, um, but I was working very long hours traveling all over the country. And then it was time for me to start a family, <laughs> which wasn't very conducive to um, motherhood. So shortly thereafter, I started my own practice uh, and I've had my own practice for um, over, uh, over 10 years. Uh, some of the proudest work that I've done. Um, I've now on the other side, so representing a young man accused of murder. Um, I represented a woman from Cameroon who was attacked by Boko Haram, and I represented her in her asylum case here uh, in Minnesota. And most recently, you may be aware of the George Floyd murder. It happened um, in the city where Professor Sonstang and I live. And as a result of that murder, there were a number of protests and quite a lot of violence that was spurred in our city subsequently. And I was honored to represent a man who, um, an indigenous man who tore down a statue of Christopher Columbus on our state capitol grounds. And I was able to um, not do a trial in that case. We did something called restorative justice, um, which is kind of a cutting edge way of dealing with some of the um, civil disobedience that our state and country has been seeing recently. So that's just kind of a highlight of some of that work, but um, it all started in uh, back in law school taking criminal law from Professor Sonsting. Makes me feel real old. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to take a nap. Um, so we look at the systems. In, in Britain, they have the barristers who train who can't get jobs if they don't get a pupillage. In the US, there's no specific training. So people can go out and start their own law firms. About 60% of our graduates go in firms of 10 or less, small firms or solo practitioners. 
and how they start, there's no, there's no requirement that they learn how to be advocates. So they will generally start in the smaller things, smaller cases, because nobody wants to hire them. Uh, the most criminal cases are tried by prosecutors who are part of an office. Uh, the larger cases of prosecutor's offices are elected. The boss is elected, stands for election every four years, then they hire a staff. Public defenders try most of the criminal cases. They um, are hired by the state. Their salaries uh, are pretty, pretty nice, $35,000, $40,000 starting. Uh, remember, there's a lot of debt, forty or $50,000. Uh, you would have probably $150,000 worth of debt coming out of law school if you didn't get scholarships, which I didn't. And um, we uh, you, you go up in a sort of a increasing salaries as you get more experience. They, the lawyers there start out with smaller cases and the internal training is training on the job, but getting less serious cases to start with. That's how I started with just simple little cases and worked my way up uh, over the 15 years I was a prosecutor. Um, but I'd like to know, we don't, have, we don't have the gowns. We don't have, the, the courtrooms are really not um, that dignified. Uh, the uh, trial lawyering at the lower level is not very good because they have no experience, no training, and the lawyers are, to make a living are very, very busy. They've got to hustle a lot of cases. Um, they, they really have to get a lot of cases. Now, one of our colleagues, Rick Petrie, is in the middle of my camera. Rick is on our faculty. He has been a criminal defense, defense lawyer and teaches in our classes of advocacy here, but um, he started his own practice too. Uh, you don't, we can't guarantee the quality of the, the lawyering. And we in our country start from the beginning, take the cases as they come in, we build the cases, we take them all the way through. In England, the solicitors do the basic background work and then hand it over to a barrister uh, to try the cases. Now, can you, someone can now come in and talk about the training for trial lawyers in Turkey. And if you're here from another country, you could probably share with us what you do if you're willing to volunteer. John, uh, maybe before starting with Turkey, <laughs> We can turn to Poland and India. We yes. have a distinguished guests from India and Poland. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yes. Let's go over to Turkey. And Barty, are you there? And Eva, uh, would you take the floor? Which oh, which one of you? Uh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm here. Barty, I'm... Okay, please go ahead and introduce yourself, please, first. Yeah, I'm Dr. Bharti Yadav uh, from India. Thank you very much, Professor Yenisi, for inviting me for this discussion forum. I work as an assistant professor of law at National Law University, Delhi. I hold a PhD degree in law, and my area of specialization is criminal law. So about my uh, country, like the how, how the profession is practiced and how the qualification is uh, acquired, I would like to tell you that after the high school, that is after studying 12 years in school, aspirants have to acquire graduation degree for three years. And after having the graduation degree, they'll have to go for the bachelor's in law. So after the school, which is of 12 years, first class to 12 class, they need to spend six years to get two degrees, that is Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of Arts. Other way of acquiring law degree in India is to join an integrated course after class 12th, uh, in which they spend only five years. And it's an integrated program where the bachelor's degree subjects are law related. They have, uh, or they, they have approach towards law and if, for example, if it's a history, then they, they, they teach the legal history and so on. So the benefit of integrated course is that, that the students save one year. Otherwise, they'll have to spend six years, three years for acquiring bachelor's degree. It can be in any stream, be it science, commerce, or arts. And after they have the bachelor's degree, uh, of graduate level, they'll have to go for another bachelor's degree that is specialization in law degree. Otherwise go for the integrated course for five years. So once they have the bachelor of law degree, they need to qualify the bar exam to appear before the court. 
before that they cannot get a license to practice before the court of law we don't have any training program after the law degree but our law courses are designed in such a way that students are imparted practical trainings they are taught the practicality of the law how laws are being practically implemented so we have four clinical courses in the law degree so we don't have like uh, i was listening to the practices in uk and us that after having the bachelor of law they uh, in uk you need to go for the practical training program whereas in USA, usa it's not so ours is that practical training program is integrated in the law degree itself so we have this training element but it's not after getting the law degree but it's in the it's integrated in the law degree program after that irrespective of any university college a person has acquired the degree be it government university or the private university we have one uniform bar exam which uh, which 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 uh, a law graduate needs to qualify to appear before the court so that's the picture about india thank you okay in, in india do the people wear uh, gowns in the courtroom yes and they wear gowns not wear they wear yeah it's similar to the uk we don't wear the uh, wigs but the same collar uh, the way i uh, just saw and the black gowns and we do have the same uniform we can wear only the blacks and grays and black and the grays like particularly the blacks and how does and it, over how does a graduate get a job when they come out uh, when they get their degree and pass the exam okay uh, so the law graduate has uh, many options in india uh, they can work in a law firm which is similar to the term which is used as a solicitor in uk so the students uh, so the law graduate even if they have not uh, not qualified the bar exam they can still work in a law firm and they do the work similar to the solicitor in uk so this is one job and it is highly paid job in india so law firms really pay good hence amount amount of salary but generally students uh, law graduate from law uh, from good law schools get placed like my uh, university offers the campus placement and our our, our students get placed in good law schools so they get handsomely paid second option is of the law researcher uh day, day by day india is is getting research oriented so after graduating and after getting the law degree the next next uh, employment opportunity is in the field of research the researcher can work in the uh, law centers of the university or we have this uh, this post of law clerks with the justice of the supreme court or the high court so they need law clerks means the law researchers who could do research for them to get them the updated uh, laws case laws to help them in drafting and all so th that is also decently paid and they get lots and lots of practical experience and knowledge from a person who is a high court or supreme court judge so it's of one year another is like they can start their own practice after getting the bachelor's degree program it's hard it's tough to start your own practice in india if you don't have family background in the field of law it's not impossible it's tough to 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 have your name and to start getting independent cases in india but if you put in so much of hard work let's say spend for 5 years you can still have but if you have someone in your family your father or somebody family member who already has established name so they they go and join it and these are the uh, three main options after getting law graduate degree researcher be it in university or the judiciary or practice or to do the solicitation work in the law firms and third one is to have your independent practice and the fourth which is very important is in india after getting the law graduate degree you can directly uh, apply for the post of 
judge in the lower court, in the district court. For that, you need to qualify the exam of judiciary and each state, each state conduct their own exam for the judicial services. So these are the four options. So they can even, even be a judge directly after getting the law graduate degree without any training. That element of training has been integrated in the law graduate degree itself, but not after that. They can qualify the, the judiciary exam. After that, they undergo one year of training program before actually sitting on the, on the chair of a judge and, and start doing their work of adjudication independently. Do we have prosecutors and defense lawyers in the criminal area? Uh, yeah, we do have. Uh, we have prosecutors. Uh, I missed out that uh, uh, the job opportunity. But for that also, they need to qualify the exam for the public prosecutor. Like judicial services examination, we each state uh, each state uh, comes with the vacancies for the post of public prosecutor. So they need to qualify this competitive exam. And after that, they, they go some training program, which is not as extensive as that of a judicial uh, magistrate. It's comparatively uh, smaller in duration, and they can be a public prosecutor. How about the defense lawyers? Are there defense lawyers that can defend someone? Yeah. We have defense lawyers uh, who are empaneled on the legal aid, legal aid office of the state, so in India, it is a right of every person to get a defense lawyer is irrespective of his if his of his financial capacity to hire one so if there is any poor person because of his um, indigency if he cannot hire an advocate then the legal aid office attached to each court provide him the free legal advocate so they empanel the advocates and generally these advocates are those new advocates who just started their career and who are not getting enough independent co in, enough independent cases where they could earn huge amount of money so what they do they get they get empaneled with the legal aid offices and they get monthly salary but then uh, it has been experienced that uh, the quality of services which is uh, provided by these advocates is it's not that good as any senior or experienced advocate provides. But something is better than nothing. The person is not unrepresented. There is an advocate who is representing his case and trying to bring him in par with the other person who is getting a state advocate that is the uh, public prosecutor. Yes. And your trials are all court trials, they're not juries, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Earlier we had the jury, but now we don't. It has been abolished. Section 160, uh, uh, six, 166 of the Evidence Act talked about the jury, uh, jury, jury element. The Evidence Act is of 1872, which is very old, but now it has been repealed. Now we don't have... Uh, jury trial, we have uh, court trials, we have adversarial system in our country, but 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 uh, now we are also 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 um, still <coughs> towards the inquisitorial element of, uh, of of the judicial system. That is why some of the features, some of the provisions of the Evidence Act or the Code of Criminal Procedure have those elements and the judicial pronouncement of the Supreme Court with is the judge should not sit as a mere spectator and he he should play an inquisitive role and he has been he has been provided uh, certain empowering provisions under which he can play that inquisitive role to extract the truth, truth to to collect the relevant evidences and to impart the justice rather than sitting as a mere spectator and pass the judgment on the basis of evidences produced by both the parties. So it's like if judge is not satisfied, under section 165 of the Evidence Act, he can call for the evidences. So though on the face of it, you will find the document says that India has adversarial system, but as far as adjudication is concerned, we have this empowering provision which empowers a judge to play an inquisitive role and to collect 
and to call for additional evidences and to and to pass the judgment on the relevant fact and to pass a judgment which could actually do the justice do our lawyers uh, give an opening speech and closing argument and direct and cross examination uh, yes they do it okay. yes right. we'll talk about those techniques later on so sure. fair Poland, did you say Ferdinand? No, I think <clears throat> we should talk about a little bit on uh, the jury trial, for pro and contra jury trial. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about. I think we'll, we'll talk about that later on when we start yeah. talking about selecting juries. I think. Okay, that's fine. But let's also talk about uh, uh, legal education in Turkey, and maybe uh, Zeynep Kahveci can. Uh, tell us about as uh, she is very close to legal education now about her experiences. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Sonstang and Professor Yenisei. Um, my name is Zeynep. I um, work at uh, Istanbul Big University uh, and I used to work as a lawyer uh, before joining the university. Uh, so in Turkey, um, Law school is taught out right after high school. Uh, so like an undergrad in the US. Um, so it is not a, an additional grad school that students go to. So it's um, a school that is for four years. Um, and um, as far as I know, if there are no elective courses, there are no mandatory courses uh, on advocacy, uh, like in the US and other systems. Um, after high school, uh, after law school, um, it used to be the case that those who want to be admitted to the bar association uh, where, uh, of the city where they reside needed to complete a year of internship. It was six months uh, at the courthouse and six months um, at a law firm uh, and also take some mandatory courses uh, from uh, the bar association um, of the, their city uh, in order to be eligible to be admitted to, to that bar association. But uh, just last year, a new law passed, which now requires students to pass a bar exam in order to be eligible. So um, in, in addition to the internship requirement, there will also be a bar exam. Uh, that will be applicable for students who entered law, who started law school this year. So we will see the first bar exam um, three years from now. Um, I think this is generally it. I'm sure we also have very experienced um, lawyers in the audience. I would like to give the floor to anyone who's willing to take the floor now. Zeynep, thank you for this introduction. Maybe we can ask now uh, Abdul Kadir Kaya who has been a judge several years and now a colleague at Bahçeşehir University to tell us about the training of judges, how it works in Turkey. Yes, thank you very much to give me floor. <clears throat> but the problem is um, I began uh, I began my profession as a judge about, about nearly 35 years ago. I know of the system for that time, but uh, there is uh, the similar education or similar training for the judges at that time. We are dealing with the matters uh, before the court, just at court, uh, listening to session uh, for the day, uh, if there is a session, then later on we work at the clerk office at the court for some time to how the registration, how the writing of the court is, you know, um, proceedings uh, at the court. But uh, it is nearly 11, 11 months, but sometimes there is this, there is need the judges. So sometimes it is for 10 months or 11 months. Later on, there is no examination, no examination. Uh, then we complete the, this uh, sessions, uh, listening to court sessions, then we promote us as a judge. But firstly, the small town to learn something better. Uh, and then later on, if you get ranking a, a little, a little uh, more skill, then you promote you to 
bigger town, through the bigger town or cities, depends you. The, for entering the judgeship, you need to get the examination. There was an examination. Uh, two times uh, there was a general examination. You have to succeed in the examination. And later on also there is a interview in the Minister of Justice. There was a uh, the high, the, you know, high judiciary, you know, body, and they came to the Minister of Justice and they interview with you, ask some questions. Uh, and if you succeed in the interview, then after one month, uh, you get the, you know, uh, your job. The, the beginning of the job, there is a, you know, uh, no, there, there is a, you know, you can lot, there is a lot, there is a place of uh, relevant uh, vacant places for the judgeship. And there is a lot, the first time you can uh, buy lot, you distribute to, uh, throughout to Turkey. And then later on the, you know, uh, the, the training for judges and prosecutors were the same, but after, uh, after you know, uh, you, ca you can prefer to be a public prosecutor or you prefer to be judge, it depends to you. Normally they respect your choice in that regard. And what you choice, they respect and they, you know, separate you uh, to the judgeship because that time for the uh, prosecutor, there is another body, another but high office of the prosecutors for the judges, uh, another system to govern the judgeship within the Turkey. But now there is academy, the justice academy. It was a nearly one year uh, you have to study in the Justice Academy, but now they change a little bit. And so three months you stayed in the Academy and uh, after six months, again, the last term you stayed in the Academy, another for three and uh, four months, then they uh, you know promote you as a judge. But Academy no normally, is is like the you know Mohani explain us as a barristers uh, training. A lot of uh, you know academician came to the academy and give the lectures. I think there is the obligation to prepare a, prepare a, you know thesis, not to, uh, for you know completing the education in the academy. You have to prepare a thesis, but not the case because we need a lot of judges so they don't request you to prepare a thesis for completion of the study. Uh, now they are you know, planning to change the academy statue. And again, and I think uh, I, uh, to make it a more efficient, more efficient. This is the very, Brief, very brief. Let me ask yes. you a um, Yes. What about defense lawyers? Uh, is there a public defender or uh, can lawyers become defense lawyers in Turkey? Defense lawyer means the, the, the lawyer, we have only lawyer. We don't, you know, separate defense lawyer or the, okay. you know, lawyer. Lawyer normally you can you can you know open a bureau after the you know school, but defense lawyer you mean I think the government pay the money because yes. you are representing people because they have, they don't have economic resources to represent themselves in Turkey in criminal cases anybody can request a defense lawyer without without making any investigation about your economic resources. If you request, request a defense lawyer, the government is ready and the Bar Association sent a lawyer to you without asking any money. All proceedings of the uh, criminal proceedings. It is free for everybody without checking whether economically uh, he's, uh, he has a capacity to pay the money. It is not important. Who pays? Who pays the fees for the lawyer? The government pay. 
the government. There is a special fund for it, and uh, it is each three months they pay the money. Even in in the in the you know police station, police station, uh, you may you may request. I need a lawyer, and uh, even in nighttime they can provide you a lawyer, and the government pay the money. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the problem with the money is they pay less. Yes. Money they pay is very poor. <laughs> this is the problem. Not a very, not, it's not very much money. How do, how do I, how do I, if I wanted to defend someone, how do I apply to uh, be appointed as a, a lawyer uh, for the defendant? I think let's ask this question to Salih Oktar, who is a defense lawyer and very prominent one. Would you tell us something about this, Oktar, Salih? Hello. Uh, uh, first, uh, defense lawyer, uh, as Abdul Kadir Kaya said, uh, there are no differences between lawyer and barrister, or litigator and solicitor. Uh, there, there is only lawyer, and um, if uh, if you if you hired a defendant, you will uh, represent at the court uh, or at the prosecution uh, period uh, your client. Um, uh, actually, uh, most defense lawyers uh, are known um, client crisis. Uh, that's why they hire uh, especially experienced uh, defense lawyer. But uh, there are no uh, legal uh, legal uh, regulation. Uh, it must be experienced lawyer. Uh, it can be a new beginner as a, a function as a as a defense lawyer, uh, actually in the criminal procedure law, regulated uh, the accused crime uh, minimum five years or more uh, sentence. Uh, the defense lawyer necessary. Uh, the other necessary uh, defense lawyer regulation, if they haven't got any economical um, medium, uh, economical economical force, um, the state will will give a defense lawyer uh, in the in the in the in the. Uh, pre-trial pre period or trial period. Um, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it must be new, new uh, reform, reform, uh, new reform. This, this necessary defense lawyer uh, regulation must be uh, increased, uh, decreased. Uh, five year, uh, minimum five year is very high level. That's why um, in the practice, uh, the people uh, will this, this level uh, increased. Let me ask you, when I was in law school, uh, we had one woman in our class. Uh, that was back in 1967, so I'm really old. And uh, now in our law school, over about 60% of the women are, are women in our law schools. What's the, what's the ratio of women in, in India uh, in law school? Can you tell, is the... Yeah, I, I can hear you, sir. Uh, yes, 
uh, even I noticed because I'm teaching for the last uh, 10 years in law school, I also noticed that the ratio of women in India was not at par with, uh, with that of men, but there is a change in the trend. Uh, in, the, in the recent uh, past, we noticed that we had 50% uh, male and the female in law graduate courses. So the trend is changing, but I remember when I was a law student, my, my, my batch has 80 students and we were only eight girls in that batch. But that was, 50, that was 20 years ago. But now I see uh, in my class, we have near to 50%, well, near to 50. Yeah, Willow, how many in your class? I was, um... When I went to law school, I was the first class where women were 50% in law school. But you might remember, Professor Sonsting, when I did trial skills training, I was the only female in the trial skills training program. And in court, uh, as a trial attorney um, in my career, oftentimes I was the only female trial attorney. But now when we teach trial skills, to attorneys, it's about 50% men and 50% women. So just in maybe 15 years, it changed from being the only woman to about 50% women, I would say in our trial skills training classes, wouldn't you say, Professor Sonstein, we've got about 50%, yeah. What's the ratio in, uh, in Turkey? Sheridan, do you know? Sheridan, uh, yes. In our law school, in at Bahçeşehir, uh, I think about 60% are women. But additionally, uh, better students are girls as well. <laughs> so this is the uh, outcome of the day. And they are better students, the girls. So women are better. Well, yeah. my, my wife would agree with that. Um, and my daughter. Uh, let's just... Uh, talk about the, and then the advocacy training, and then we'll start talking about this case and getting ready for trial but, and what, what cross-examination means. And then we'll, we will talk about the jury selection process or the jury process, uh, yep. either at the end of today or the first part of next week. But can I ask a question, yes. Yes. Mr. Uh, Professor Sonsteng? Uh, yeah. uh, yes, uh, but something I, I I have to clear for the defense lawyer is not obligation to all lawyer. There is no obligation. As a lawyer, you have to apply to the bar association and register your name as a defense lawyer. Otherwise, nobody forced you to go to court and to defend someone. So it is better to make this point uh, clear. I, so you don't you don't have a public defender system, but if I wanted to be a defense lawyer in criminal cases, I would register. Is that right? Yes. Okay. If you want, you can go to bar association, give your name, address, and telephone number. So it means you are ready to to be a defense lawyer. It is not need, obligation. And you know, you don't have to have any special advocacy training. Is that right? Yes, of course. You have to have a advocacy training. You have to be rigid. you have to be member of the bar association. To be bar association, you have to complete your uh, training of as a for the advocacy. You have yeah. completed, but not not a special training. But in the bar association for the defense lawyer, there is always special program to prepare them for this job. Every Week, for example, there is a seminar. There is a special, you know, lecture for them. They actually, in first three months, they have to complete this special program to be a defense lawyer uh, within the bar association. There is a special program to give to give them a special, you know, training. Uh, how do, how do they act? What, what is the rights? and all these kind of things, uh, you know, explain them at the beginning, at the very beginning. Good, well, um, we have a wonderful, a good question here uh, to 
to all of us uh, about preparing a paper, and I think this is true, as we go through this, if it, the group, all of you think it's worthwhile, we may, uh, we've talked about it, put together a, a paper, not an academic paper, but a paper showing the similarities and differences between the various countries. And when we come down and the different skills that are necessary to act as a lawyer in a criminal trial, I think that would be useful for everyone. And as we go forward with the uh, talking about direct and cross-examination and closing arguments, and at the end, try this case, we can write up a paper if, if people are willing and you, anyone who can contribute to it uh, and, and publish it because I think would be very helpful and would also help us learn from each other. Because as I'm listening here, <clears throat> I knew some of the things uh, that I before, but I, things are coming out that I didn't know. Uh, for instance, I think that uh, uh, robes, gowns would be very important for our country to, to level the playing field. So um, does that make sense? Is it, if we can find that you would agree, I think somebody said it would be helpful. Um, it said, uh, no training is not mandatory for the private practice in criminal law, only mandatory for defense lawyers as a part of legal aid. So, I, and I, again, I don't know what, it's, it's not mandatory in our country either. And as we think about it, uh, and, and this is my next topic is how in the world do we become good advocates, persuasive, good advocates, if we don't have any training, uh, real lifelong training. Now I, and Willow knows this, I, I work out and train almost every day uh, on, not on physical training, but on my skills as an advocate. And as I get older, uh, I realize I cannot memorize things. I can learn them quite well, but I'm not good at memorizing. Maybe I never was good at it, but how do I work on my voice, my structuring, the cadence, the kinds of things that are persuasive. I watch a lot of um, lawyering movies to see what people are doing, but I also watch the sports commentators, and I also go to various churches and listen to the preachers preach uh, to see the techniques they use. It makes my wife a little angry, but I watch them not for the content, but how they deliver and to see if what they're delivering is um, I understand the message or enjoy the message better by the techniques that are being used. So I'm studying all the time on what people are doing to see if I can incorporate and learn from them the techniques about uh, persuasion. And I find that as I'm getting older, I can, um, well, I can do a lot more. I can maybe do things that I never would have done before because people excuse me because from my white hair perhaps. But uh, we'll be talking about that kind of training because I. I don't think there's universal training and there's no continuing training. So we would never think of a sports team um, going into a match, football, uh, and I think soccer football, without practicing or an opera singer practicing or a person who plays the piano or uh, has a craft. And the only profession that I know of that doesn't practice the thing we say we do is lawyering. We don't practice that. We don't practice it at all. Well, the other thing we don't practice is we don't teach anything in law school about how to be a lawyer. I mean, we can learn how to take tests, but we don't teach how to run the business of being a lawyer, how to be efficient with your time and bill your hours and market yourself and have client development and client retention and representation agreements. We do none of that. How do I, how do I go about running an office and ordering paper, or toilet paper, or whatever it is? We don't do any of that training at all. And if that is something that's worth talking about, I think it's, I think it's important. I think it's a big flaw in the system. You will see in one of the things we've given you uh, on, on one of the materials, Willow, it was attached to something we sent. It's a paper called the Open Resource Tool. Uh, what we're doing here is part of what we thought of as the Open Resource Tool is gathering people together to learn from each other, to connect from each other, uh, from each other and really learn. Because I, I spent time in, in, in Turkey and I spent time in England watching and listening and learning from people who do things, the same things in different cultures. And it is amazing. We taught a course in Istanbul in which the lawyers were, uh, that the course were laughing about the American television shows and how awful the behavior of lawyers was in the courtroom. So we actually had this criminal case that you're gonna look at. And we asked the lawyers, the Turkish lawyers to um, be the lawyers in the case. And so they get up and all the ones who were doing it, they started looking like American lawyers. 
They started acting out and doing all sorts of things because the audience was there and on them. And we had, we started laughing so much we had to quit because it became so funny that the people who were criticizing the American lawyers changed their behavior because of the open viewed contests. So I think that's something we should talk about and you all can add to it. The fact that you're here demonstrates to me that you have an interest in, in doing this. So um, do we have any other comments that- um, well, I think John, this is the essence of our work here, what you have said. At law school in Turkey, we don't teach lawyering skills. We teach law, but we don't teach how to be a good lawyer. And additionally, in uh, Justice Academy, they don't teach how to be a good judge, how to act as a judge. They teach uh, legal part of everything. And additionally, also as a practice, uh, apprentices. They learn, but they don't learn how to be a good lawyer. So now in this course, in this five weeks, we are going to try to commit you, to convey you uh, through John Sunstein's uh, skills, how to be a good lawyer, how to talk, how to dress, etc. These are the more important, how to persuade the opponent party or the judge. So this is the main aim of our work here. This is what I wanted to stress out. I think it's interesting, we, we can talk about it, but I, I haven't figured out, and perhaps with this group, I, we could figure out how to do it. I haven't figured out how in the world can we train in a way that uh, doesn't take away from our families and our job. I mean, how do we do it? I mean, our, the money's not so much. We don't have a coach. Uh, we're not making the kind of money that a, a star footballer is gonna make. But how do we train on a regular basis so that as we get older, as we get more experience, how can we be best at this wonderful job of persuading people? Um, for me, it is the biggest honor uh, to be in court. For my clients, uh, it's like being in center court Wimbledon or at the World Cup, because for them, even this a speeding ticket is extremely important. So we should be doing everything we can to persuade. Um, I have not read Cicero, but I know that Cicero spoke about every word counting, every word and action counting to persuade and to get people to believe what I am selling is worth buying. And I don't mean that uh, sarcastically. I think my job is to do everything I can <clears throat> within the rules of evidence and the rules of decorum and the rules of procedure to persuade uh, the trial judge, if it's a judge, case to a trial or to a jury. Uh, I do the same kinds of things with the judge as I would to a jury. I, I do not do the stuff you see on television, but I want the judge to understand my case and per be persuaded that what I am talking about is what should be done. So how do we do it? How do we practice? <clears throat> I think it has to be every day. Um, but one of the things that Willow and I were talking about earlier today is um, in preparing for a trial, of any kind, and this is a lifelong thing. Uh, I think we prepare like we were preparing for a very important match. Now, I, uh, when I started almost 50 years ago, uh, we started keeping a, a book before, this is before computers. We started keeping a book on everybody. I kept a organized book alphabetically by lawyer, by judge, um, everybody. So I, to, to know what that person's strengths or weaknesses are. Uh, we knew the judges, we knew how the judges wanted to operate, how they wanted the room set up. What did they do? Did they drink at noon? Did my opponent uh, have six children and have to go to all sorts of children's things so that uh, the lawyer couldn't be prepared? Because it makes a difference for me to understand what my lawyer, does, does my opponent understand the rules of evidence? Is my opponent experienced? Is my opponent, uh, dishonest or honest or afraid uh, in our book. Now we, I've converted that into a computer program now, uh, but I also know what the courtrooms are. I mean, you may think this, this is kind of sick, but I know what the courtrooms are, where their plugs are, where the outlets are, what kind of equipment they have, how much clutter is in there, what does the judge see of me, what's behind me in the courtroom? Is it clutter? Or do I have a lovely bookshelf like Professor Yenesi has, or the bookshelf that uh, Karim has behind him. Uh, what, what is the view of him, of me, but 
what's in, in that room. And I think it, it really makes a difference. If you start watching, when you see someone talking and they are bumbling, or you see a politician talk and they are bumbling, and I, we have gone through that quite a bit in our last year or so, understanding how different people are perceived from our president and uh, the people that uh, are running here uh, in politics. Who are the ones we want to believe? Why do we believe them? What techniques are they using to persuade? And that's things we should think of. It should not be an accident. How do I set my room? How do I set up the room? Um, and in just when I'm meeting with, meeting with a client, what's in the room? Where, what's the lighting like? And I think about all that. And what do I wear? Do I, I decided today not to wear a tie because I didn't uh, want to be formal. And so I should, I mean, all this counts, I think. What kind of eye contact do we have? And I think that now because of Zoom, this technology, we are going to be uh, thinking about how we use this tool most effectively. Uh, I have a class on Monday night with uh, 20 students and we are figuring out how to use the backgrounds uh, in the room so it's consistent backgrounds so that we can um, have a good view so there isn't a blank wall behind us. In actual jury trials, I would make sure that my table was clean, uh, there wouldn't be clutter uh, the view of me, of the jury or judge to me would be with something behind me. So uh, it wouldn't be clutter, it wouldn't be a pile of coats and sweaters, it wouldn't be piles of scraps of paper. So I would like you to think about this uh, as a team here, a hundred of us thinking about how we can use these tools and your commentary on this as we go forward. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna understand the system. I promise you, we will put together uh, Willow and I and anyone who wants to be participate, we will put together a comparison of the systems and how to get there and uh, get to be a lawyer, but we'll also then see if we can make improvements on what we do personally and learn from each other. So is any, um, anybody have any further comments or want to go on further? Because I'm ready to talk about juries now if we'd like to do it. May I take a vote? Yes. That's all right. Yeah, yes. and first of all, I am respectfully greetings to everyone. And my name is Onurut Kusim, and I'm and joining to this program from Justice Academy of Turkey. It's a great honor to be here with my colleague. And as my colleagues in mentioned before, we have the different system, and we when we compare to other countries as United States or the Great Britain. Uh, but on the other hand, and we have to and reveal the position of the judges and the prosecutors in the first day because, and at the same time, I'm a judge and a lecturer at the Justice Academy of Turkey for uh, two years, and we have a different system. So, and for example, in our, in our system, the prosecutors can make decisions and search warrant and uh, with the circumstances of, and having a reasonable a doubt in case of the delay, and after that, uh, the prosecutors, it, it must be submitted to the judge's approval in it, within the 24 hours. So in our system, uh, we have not a solicitor or barrister or defender. And, but on the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, in our system, the public prosecutors in a different position or have the different positions because they can obtain or and they can collect evidences, not just against the accused or suspicious, and at the same time, in favor of all of these parts. So, and we know that in our system is different, but on the, on the other hand, uh, interrogation techniques or and direct and the cross examinations techniques are the same. So, and actually I can say that we have the same terminology, but different system. Uh, but uh, I think that it will be very productive a program for us and also our colleagues and also candidates of judges and prosecutors. And additionally, and I can say that in our system, in when it requires the four and years degree and faculty and the, to be a judge or prosecutor, they have to enter, take exam, my and colleague said, and after that, in winning this exam, we and train the, all of the candidates, the effective candidates, because we have the different techniques as in national or international 
and respectable and educational institutions, for example, and we use uh, from AR technology or VR technology or a mood courts or a workshop. And so we expect our candidates and uh, skill, having the skill, not just informative knowledge and also practical knowledge, because we all know that the, uh, the procedure of this training session not required to and uh, having a formal information and also practical information. So by the way, um, in this system, we have and uh, in the next term, a two years uh, training session. And the, in the first stage, uh, the, our candidates have, um, I think one year industry courts in court of cassations and also local courts and other hand, and we train them for six months, uh, sorry, it's seven months. And first stage is include a three months and the other and the last one is the four months. So, and we expect our candidates to having a problem solving skills, acquiring and uh, make a decision or problem solving in a while the under a realistic pressure. Uh, let me, and let me take an example, for example, and we use a voice record while our uh, educational system, and I wanna and emphasize this, and for mm -hmm. example, and we prepared realistic voice from the police because in our system, the police are in, in jurisdiction works, working in jurisdictions under the prosecution's order. So in our system, the, our prosecu prosecutors have to be a very and ready to their profession. Uh, let me see this, sorry for this, but it's a, a great uh, example uh, for this. Let me see, sorry. Uh, by the way, and we use not just and an face-to-face training system and also and we use and distinct, distinct learning techniques. And for example, is a realistic, realistic and environment and environment sounds. And we expect our candidates and also our prosecutors make decisions in a realistic and a psychological pressure. So in, in our course, we give not informal information as mentioned before, and also personal development courses and or lessons, and also and the, the other and international etiquette, etc. So and we are in conducting this training sessions and more practical. At that time, and you can see that in our candidates and also our and colleagues uh, is feel that more ready to their profession. So, and finally, I'm very grateful to join this program. I think uh, we'll uh, learn a lot of um, useful information as regards. Thank you very much. Well, I just judge, thank you. I think that, see, in, in the US, we don't have anything like that. Uh, uh, prosecutors, uh, the ones in the larger serious cases are all elected and how they train their office, uh, you, you have no idea. Uh, and mm -hmm. in, the, in the smaller cases for the cities, they hire their prosecutor and there is no training for them at all, not required by anybody. And so I think the lesson, what you've done is you've, you've provided a system that assures the quality of advocacy is better from the uh, prosecutor standpoint because they're being trained and they've been trained in practical stuff rather than just law. And I think that as we write this up, we must think about how that is done. I think the judiciary has to take a responsibility that it's not happening in the law school and it's not happening by our elected officials. It's gotta be the courts that have got to say, here's how you must proceed in order to have quality of both, uh, both defense and prosecution to raise the quality of advocacy. So I think what you've just said, that is a very important note for us as an example of where we can learn and we can improve. Because I'm very selfish. I'm trying to 
improve our system, I, but I don't think we can do it at the law school level uh, because of the acad ac academics uh, want to just talk about teaching law rather than the practical things that are important. So um, you, you do, so we have the British jury system, we have the American uh, jury system, and uh, I think they have in Australia, but in most countries, it's not a jury. Now, in Turkey, do you have a one judge decider or do you have a panel? A panel of three or just one? Panel system. A panel system? There, there, there is one judge system and the panel judge system. It depends. If it is a serious crime court, there is a panel. But for the, you know, uh, you know, the first, the other criminal courts, there is only one judge. And does the prosecutor sit on the bench with the y Yes, sit, yes, on the bench, the prosecutor. The same bench. Yes, yes same the, bench. Yes, and the judge has the right to ask questions, right? Yes, of course. Yes, yes. In, in our system, the judges do not ask questions. They only, unless it's a, a, a judge trial, but they do not ask questions the only rule on evidence. Uh, in England, the judge will sum up at the end, will sum up the evidence, and that can be very persuasive for one side or the other, depending on how the judge does it. So I think it's all really interesting. And we, again, your training system is really important. So as we do this, perhaps you will write us as, and just remind us, and we'll, we'll do this as we develop a universal or an international uh, system for training. I and mean, it'll be great fun for all of us to train together. I would love to go to a course and learn the, if I, I can't speak Turkish, but if we could, I could speak English and apologize for that, uh, we could learn from each other. I've, I've tried a few words, but I can't do it. So, um, let's talk just a bit about the jury system and then, and then we'll, um, we'll end. We have 16 minutes left. Um, and I, I, I don't know if any of you have watched American television programs, um, but there are some that, uh, I think Manali was talking about uh, the uh, jury system asking questions. And let me just share with you that uh, because we have the system in our country, it is a very, very bizarre thing if you were to watch what people do. Uh, we, uh, they select jurors from a variety of different places, voter rolls, telephone directories, um, tax rolls, and they draw them randomly and bring them in. Now, as a lawyer, I know that morning of my trial who is on the panel of jurors. And I am allowed to ask questions to do two things. One, to make sure that the juror is fair and one to discover biases or prejudices that may influence the trial. That's what the rules say. But there are people who use the um, artificial intelligence, the electronic media. So as soon as I know by nine o'clock in the morning, I will know who the panel is. I can have a staff person in my office quickly do a Google search. And there's actually levels of Google searches, as you all know. I can find out everything about the jurors. I know who they are. I know where they live. I can get um, pictures of their home. I can get pictures from aerial maps. I know if they're a juror, a juror in a who has a yard that's messy when in a neighborhood that's very neat. I can find everything out about them. I can actually find out um, where they voted. I can actually find out their credit cards and where they had their dinner and the kind of food they have very, very quickly. Uh, if the idea is to know as much about your audience as you can, uh, if that's, and some people believe that's important, I can then make decisions about who I can strike. And we will have, let's say we have a 12 person jury, um, the oftentimes in a regular jury, the defense would get five, get to strike five people. The prosecution would get three, but that varies from state to state. That's how it is in Minnesota. So we get to ask questions about them, but we can also use this process of asking questions to persuade people. Now that's not said anywhere in the rules, but if I have the, if I have a tool I'm going to use it. For instance, if you've had the, read the file, um, 
you see that the question is about an identification of a defendant in which uh, things happen very quickly. Now, I might ask uh, the juror, uh, was Kaktu, is that how I pronounce your court name? Yes? Kemri? If I got. May I ask you, may, pretend you are a jury, okay? Uh, sure. sure, okay, sure. So she's there, I know nothing about her, but I can say to her, uh, yeah. have you ever been in a situation where you saw someone walking down the street and thought you recognized the person and then realized you were wrong? Did that ever happen to you? Sure. <laughs> Since I, uh, I'm a myopa, <laughs> I, I live it uh, very have often. You ever made a have you ever made a mistake like that? Uh, yes. Have you, have you ever eaten in a restaurant and at the end of the meal looked for the server but couldn't recognize who the server was? Has that ever happened? Uh, yes, sure. <laughs> well, right there now, what I'm doing is I'm going to say in my opening speech, they picked the wrong person. I'd, eyewitness identification is very faulty. Even in everyday life, we make mistakes. So now I've got a juror who understands about making mistakes. So I have used my questioning to manipulate. If she said to me, no, I've never made a mistake. I'm always perfect. I'm a marvelous person. I have a, a eyes like a hawk. I have a memory like a, like, like, like a machine. Well, then we know that we can get rid of her. Uh, because she's not telling the truth. So, I mean, I can use that jury selection process to find out about her. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, that's just part of the process in which I'm going to strike people, but I'm also having a conversation with it. So then I would go to the next person. Uh, is it Ramazan? Yes, Kaya? Mr. Kaya? Yes? Yes, are you there? Is it for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, I'm not jury. I'm not the member of the jury, I think. But oh, anyway. Okay. Well, <laughs> let, me, let me move up here to Mr. Kaya right above you on my picture. It's Ramazan? Yes, sir. So I have just talked to, is it Kamre? Chemre. Uh, it's Chemre. Chemre. All right. I said, I just talked to Ms. Chemre. Have you ever had an experience like that? And so I will get him talking and meeting the other person and we start getting this jury working together because my idea is to get people who will make decisions that way. So, I mean, that's the, the concept of jury selection is to use it to persuade. But I'm also, which is, if you ever would turn out, go on to YouTube or Google, the show called Bull, B-U-L-L. -L. It is a bizarre show. But in that, this man is a jury selection consultant. Uh, Willow, have you ever watched that program? No, they have tons of money and they use it and they do all sorts of things like lawyers will make decisions on eye contact, what people are wearing, stances, whether the juror is an open stance or closed stance, trying to predict how a person will decide a case that they haven't heard. And there are jury consultants in our country that make enormous amount of money consulting on who should be on that jury. Remember, we get, you get to get rid of a few. So out of 20 people, we get rid of eight, five and three. Uh, I get, if they have a bias or prejudice that's demonstrated, I can get rid of them and I can strike them for cause. And then I, they replace them or I can use what we call a peremptory strike. I can remove a juror for any reason at all, unless I'm removing them because of their race or religion uh, or other political beliefs. I can't strike them for those reasons. But we are really manipulating this group of people. And it's been, we're doing that because under our system, every single tool that I can use, I use. Every single tool I can use, I can use. So we think about how do I ask questions? Where do I stand? How do I make contact, eye contact with them? How do I find out? Like if it's a religious thing, I might say to um, Omer, what do you do on a Saturday morning? And I might ask him what he does. Or, if we're in a place where people go to church on Sunday, I may say, what do you do on a Sunday morning? If I want to find out, if I'm not going to say, what's your religion? But I'll find out what they do on a Sunday morning. I'll find out if I can identify this juror and with my client, who is a re very religious person. I mean, that's the, the concept. It's, uh, there are books and books written about this process of selecting a jury. Not persuading, but 
selecting a jury. And if you ever looked at it, you would you would be shocked. I think if you haven't looked at it, you'd be shocked at the things that people say about jurors. My wife was chosen as to sit as a juror, and they found out that she was uh, related to me, and they struck her because they knew I was a prosecutor, as the defense did. And little did they know that because she knew what I did, she was very defense oriented, and would have lean towards the defendant, but they made some value judgments because we were related. So I think that lawyers make some bizarre things and you can actually go to, I go to programs and watch how um, people teach jury selection. Willow, have you been to some of those programs? I have been to the programs and I have tried and tried and tried to do it. And I think the after years of taking classes, teaching classes, and more importantly, doing it, I've walked away one, recognizing that the opportunity to choose a jury is one of the most interesting things that you can ever do as a lawyer, and that I'm wrong. <laughs> it's just as Professor Sonstang says, if you come, come to the table with a belief system that if the wife of a prosecutor has a prosecutorial uh, perspective, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong so many times that I've stopped trying to guess and I've stopped trying to ask these questions and I've instead changed my strategy. Uh, I ask things like, what is your idea of the American dream? And I start to get jurors talking and really my goal is to have them interested and to establish credibility so that when I give my opening statement, they like me, I hope, and at least believe that I'm an effective lawyer because I'm done trying to guess how people are gonna make decisions based on political beliefs or gender or race or religion because there's no, it's, it's, it's all guesswork. And oftentimes the ones who I really think I've got because you know, I think, oh, maybe if they have liberal political beliefs, they'll be more, um, more apt to, to be sympathetic to my criminal defendant client. It, it, I, I, I can't, it, people do, <laughs> people make their decisions based on values that we can't see and that are really difficult to um, ascertain. I don't know, maybe next year I'll change my perspective, but I'm kind of, um, it's, it's fascinating. It's an absolutely fascinating process. And I've sort of decided the best I can do is sort of try to be the most credible attorney I can so that they believe me when it's time for me to give my opening statement. Uh, one of the things that uh, Chuck, the judge with your comments about the, the lawyers and persuasion, I like to try cases before a judge, however, if I know the judge has a particular dislike of me or has a particular feeling about that, it makes it more difficult for me to persuade. So I want the judge, judges always to respect me and know that I'm playing, I'm straight, I'm honest and straightforward. Uh, and I don't try to have the judge like me because that's not what I'm all about, but I want him to trust me and think I'm honest. And then I wanna make a presentation that the judge who may be looking at me nodding his head as if he understands and he's thinking when he nods his head, boy, Sunstein is so dumb. He's such a stupid clown, but he's nodding his head and I'm getting these feelings that the judge is persuaded by what I am saying. I'm trying to make sure that every judge I appear in front of thinks that I'm straight and honest. And, and then I try to make my cases so simple, so straightforward, but it's easy for the judge to find on my behalf and I, or the jury. I think I do like jurors only that I think I'm pretty good at it as I got older. As a younger person, I was not very good at it. As I get older, I think I'm good at getting to the nut of a case and making it simple and straightforward. Um, but I think the trials for judges before judges and jurors are, are the same techniques apply and they're just as important. Uh, trust, believability, simplicity, organization, uh, not big words. I'm not trying to prove that I'm smart. I don't use big words. I'm not very smart. I don't use big words. Um, I use just straight, simple language. <coughs> and I try not to put too much in detail because it's boring. So I try to be interesting. And Judge, we can, are you gonna be coming for the whole time, Judge uh, uh, Seven? 
Are you going to be coming? Are you there? No? All right. Are you there? Are you going to be coming at other times, Judge? Is it dead? Yes. Huh? Are you all right? Yes, I'm, I'm all right. Yes, I'm listening to you. Uh, Are you going to be coming to other sessions? Yes, uh, I'm, to, I'm coming to all sessions. I, I'm, I'm going to participate all sessions. Good. Oh, we'll be there. We were there, okay. Mr. Okay. Sainz. Okay. Probably. Yes, well, so what, what we want to do is we go forward, we'll be talking about the, the things with techniques that we're talking about, and then we can get a discussion going for the judge judging it from their perspective sitting on the bench alone. Now, mm -hmm. you've, got a cop, you've got a copy of the trial book, which is uh, one may, that, uh, Firstly, mm -hmm. it may sound weird, but and as the decision of European Court of Human Rights, as I remember that through Turkey decision, and it is not a contrary to uh, equality of the arms because, as I mentioned before, and in our system, prosecutors are not and uh, collecting or obtaining evidence and against of the accused or suspicious, and especially if that uh, if the all the events or evidences show the uh, that innocence of this uh, accused or suspicious. And uh, so uh, it, he or she can demand and not do uh, imprisonment or not to give any fine. So uh, by the way, and uh, I think it is about the differences of our systems. Yeah. Because in your system and a barrister and solicitor or a defender side and has or has to affect the jury. But in our systems, just one point, just one a focus point uh, is that in a judge. So, and it may sound weird, but in our systems, and it's not a country of equality of the arms. We can say that. Well, we, I, as, as, a pro, I did, as a prosecutor for 12 years and my whole goal was to be honest, uh, we did not bring cases that we felt were not, uh, should not be brought. But we do have prosecutors in our country who are not the same. We have prosecutors who bring cases for political reasons. And that's why the defense lawyer has a tremendous burden uh, in those cases. And I think that will be part of our discussion. Uh, we have one minute left because we promised this would be two hours. Uh, I, I don't like to go beyond it. And for you, it's very late in the evening. Uh, it's what, 1030 at night now? Mm -hmm. Yes, 10.30. Yes. I want to say something about yes. the system. And you can. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. For, for the system, it's the most important thing that the decision-making body should be <clears throat> independent in, and impartial. So is jury in U.S. independent? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they are. They're supposed to be. They're independent. Yes. Is jury in U.S. Uh, impartial? Uh, I, you know, every person brings their own biases and prejudices, their own lens, the way they look through things. So I don't know when I have them. It's supposed to be impartial, but I don't think anybody is. I think a judge usually is the most impartial person. Most most of them are most are impartial because they that's their job. Jurors, uh, they say they're impartial, but I don't think so. I don't believe they are. So this is the most important thing for me, impartiality and independence. If we secure both of them, both systems are well. But if there are some uh, defaults in those, then it's a problem for the system. So this is what, as I wanted to put out forward. I agree uh, with you uh, on, on everything, really. Uh, I think that's one of the things we'll talk about is the ethics of using the tools to do a persuasion from jury selection to final argument, the ethical standards. And uh, I'm gonna talk about it. I'm gonna talk about doing different things and we can discuss whether I have done things that are unethical or not. Uh, I'll try not to, but we can discuss that. That's really an important part of this whole program. Uh, so I would like you to be thinking about it between now and next week, if you have a few minutes. And uh, next week, we'll start about case planning and case theory. 
uh, and we're starting to talk about opening statements next week. All right. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Yenesey. Thanks, uh, Professor well, Anderson. The next week. Good to see you all. Have a good week and weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.